Hi everyone, this is Caitlin Cashin from Gatsby. Uh, we're gonna hold off for just a couple minutes before we get started to make sure people have time to log in and, and settle. So if you'll bear with us for just uh, two or three more minutes, we'll be getting started very shortly, thanks. All right, well, it's a couple minutes past our start time, so let's go ahead and kick things off. Um, before we jump into our presentation, I'm gonna do a little housekeeping. First off, hi, my name is Caitlin Cashin. I'm a marketing manager at Gatsby, and our speakers today are Mark Amon, principal at Matter Supply, and Bob Orchard, who is uh, one of our, or maybe our only senior product manager here at Gatsby. If you require captions for the webinar, there is a link in the chat to our live streaming captions. Uh, additionally, it, a link should have been included in um, you know, your previous GoToWebinar login email or uh, HubSpot email. And secondly, we're going to be doing our questions in um, an application called Slido. I put a link to that as well in the chat. Um, alternatively, you can go to slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, and you'll input hashtag or, you know, hash sign L as in Lucy 210. Um, if, you know, you're having an issue with that, you can input quest questions through the GoToWebinar control panel, uh, but please try to use Slido um, for, for your questions. After Mark does his presentation, we'll take about five minutes for questions. Then we'll hand things over to Bob and then the remaining time after Bob's presentation will be open for questions. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to you, Mark. Give me just a second. All right, you should have controls. I do. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, first off, I want to thank Gatsby again for for hosting us again. These uh, these webinars are always fun. Uh, this is our second one, and uh, this is my fourth time of talking about this uh, Nike Just Do It uh, experience. So, uh, thank you for indulging me uh, once again. But I I'll probably run out of anecdotes after this uh, this webinar. So kind of have to do another project before we do this again. Um, so this is us, uh, we're Matter Supply. We're a, a team of uh, roughly 30 people across a few offices, um, mainly Medellin, Colombia and uh, Portland, Oregon, two beautiful cities. And we have a, a few small satellite offices in Albuquerque, New Mexico and uh, uh, in Minneapolis. And uh, this is me. Um, I'm Mark. I'm one of the principals uh, at Matter Supply. 
one of the two founders and founded Mary Supply three years ago in seven days. So we have our, our birthday on the on uh, February 20th. So excited to to talk to you today about um, how we actually moved uh, a CMS a few times or a, a, a site a few times onto different CMS systems. Uh, first off, a little bit about us. Um, when we started Matter Supply, we realized there was a lot of noise out there and we had to actually cut this down a little bit uh, for us to understand who we are. And we are a company that transforms wild ideas into unexpected experiences. That is at the very core of who we are. And what we, what we mean by that is that we let our clients dream crazy and go wild. And we are here to help them actually create an experience and products out of this. And we curated an extremely talented team of creative technologists, product designers, strategists. And that isn't to say that these are their roles or titles. Um, for us, everybody on our team is a bit of a technologist, a bit of a designer, and a bit of a strategist. And it's been a lot of fun over the past three years uh, to work with everybody on the team. Um, we all share one common why, and that is because we want to focus on purpose, people, and connections. Um, instead of design and content only, we said connections are more like as important, if not more important, to bring people together with technology and with design. And uh, we've done this now for three years. Right? We've had a few fun clients. One of them is Impossible Foods. Uh, we've done impossiblefoods.com. We've built a location, uh, the locator experience for Impossible Foods and all on the Jamstack. And it's been fun. It's been a great experience. And um, we've been on it for over a year at this point, or I think even a year and, and a half at this point. Um, recently launched a new experience called the Taste Place, which is a loyalty experience for Impossible Foods. So if you if you like Impossible Foods, the meat is actually great, much better than Beyond Meat. Um, you should check it out. It's fun. Get a free T-shirt, um, or for just eating uh, Impossible Foods and doing something good for the world. Also on the Jamstack, um, and it's driven by a Shopify experience under the hood uh, through an API. So that was a fun experience to build as well. A bit more serious note, we have other clients um, that are very near and dear to our heart. Um, Notifica is one of them, which is an app for uh, immigrants uh, and DACA recipients who face deportation in the United States. So when uh, uh, when ICE or the police picks them up, they have a way of actually alerting their immediate family members and, and other people in their defense network to come to their aid make sure their children are safe, make sure their families know where they are and so forth to, to build a little bit of a peace of mind um, as much as we can, as much as we can do. Fortunately, there's not a ton we can do, um, but that's, that's something that is very near and dear to our heart. Another project in the same vein is Raheem.org. Raheem aims to be no less than the, the best aggregator of uh, uh, stories around police violence and police incidents in the United States. Um, it allows you to record stories and uh, police interactions and uh, have witnesses and build a database of police interactions and see where bias exists and where we need to take action. Um, but to go back to what we're here uh, to talk about today is um, a year and a half ago, Nike approached us um, and gave me a call while I was uh, having a, a cup of coffee. And uh, it was from a friend of mine who I used to work with over at Nike. And she said, hey, we need you to help us launch a website um, to support a high profile campaign that doesn't look like Nike.com at all and actually allows us to react to whatever happens during this big campaign and potentially even take over the Nike.com homepage for today. And uh, we thought, OK, that's fun. Um, let's do this, right? That's, that sounds like a, a fun challenge to do. Uh, at this campaign was Colin Kaepernick and also Venus Williams um, had a big story on the on the launch moment on launch day. Uh, the basic premise was simple. Um, we wanted to allow people to submit dreams, dream big with all of us, like with Colin and Venus Williams, and they all have big dreams at some point, and I'm sure they still do. Um, but what we wanted to do was invite everybody around the world to dream with us and dream big. However, what we also wanted to do was showcase a lot of other stories uh, of big dreamers in the world. Um, and then behind the scenes, Nike would actually go in and, and surprise some of these big dreamers with uh, custom swag at practice or wherever they are, 
at school and, and, and create custom shoelaces and whatnot. Um, and this was not announced. Um, this was just something that happened behind the scenes. Um, but again, as I mentioned, the idea wasn't to just tell the story of Colin and, and Venus Williams. It was really to showcase other stories that are out there of big dreamers um, and of people that, that they are big and, and have a lot of courage. Um, however, it needed to be live in four weeks, um, which isn't which isn't a fun timeline from first phone call to uh, to launch day. Um, and with the four weeks also came the requirement that it has to be on our infrastructure, not on Nike's infrastructure, because you can't just launch something like this big in four weeks um, in, in an organization this large, because Nike does a good due diligence around this. And uh, as you should, as a big organization, to actually make sure that everything you launch is, is, is well built and scales well. Um, so we were on our own on this one. Um, and this was our first time actually working with Nike again. So we had started Mass Supply three years ago and we had worked with Nike before in our previous jobs. So this is the first time they actually worked with us directly as a, as a client. So you kind of don't want to mess this up because we were just eight people deep at that point. Um, and this was, uh, this was one of those like big breaks um, that you don't want to miss out on. So we said, sure, love it. Um, and uh, how about we blow this up a little bit and actually make this a real time star field simulation with WebGL, where people can enter their dreams and they get a star assigned in, in a smooth shape. And then um, they can actually share that asset that they got, um, a very unique generated asset, and actually commit to their dreams publicly on Facebook and so forth. All great, right? Um, uh, that's what any sane uh, business owner would do at this point. Um, which ended up looking something like this. So you see there's a, a, a star field in the shape of a swoosh. Um, and you see the yellow dot in the middle. That's actually my dream. And people were able to share this asset. And all the dreams in the swoosh were actually real time. So as people entered dreams, like uh, dots would pop in and out. And the, the swoosh was constantly animated with people submitting dreams. And what you see in the background is not schmutz on your screen. It's actually uh, little stars that would animate as people visit the site. So there was a real time experience in the background too that would uh, ping visitors and pop in stars in and out in, in the background experience to visualize this. Um, however, that's not what I wanna talk about today. Um, this is just fun advertising for our agency. Uh, what I wanna talk about today is uh, what they really wanted to do was showcasing these stories of people that matter. Um, for example, this is the story of Sky Brown. She's a 10 year old uh, or nine year old skateboarder at the time, now 10. She's going to be the youngest skateboarder at the 2020 Olympics. And she's pretty badass. Um, and her brother is uh, up and coming as well. He's, I think, eight years old at this point. Um, and Nike wanted us to help them tell these stories in a very bespoke and unique way that doesn't, that's not as, uh, as restricted as, for example, it was on Nike.com. Um, and the requirements were pretty simple, right? We needed to scale up to a million plus visits a day easily, especially if you have to launch on Nike.com, like the homepage itself and submit about a hundred thousand dreams per week. Seems, seems reasonable. All of those numbers seem reasonable. And, um, with that, we realized, well, we need, it needs to be fast. It needs to be scalable. It needs to be secure because people are able to actually submit dreams and, and have use generate the content. Um, and we know these three S's, right? This is the three S's that everybody who sells you on the jam stack, that everybody has has this slide in their deck, everybody who tries to sell you on the jam stack. Um, speed, scalability, and security. Um, however, as technologies, uh, technologists go, they they like to experiment with uh, with with different things. So we had uh, Kubernetes was in play and, and all of that fun stuff that, um, and some wild ideas on how to scale this to a few million visitors and whatnot. And we ended up playing it safe. Um, and it's funny to say this, but playing it safe was going with the jam stack um, because we had built impossible foods on that stack prior and we've done a few other small, smaller experiences. So we decided, yeah, let's go with jam stack um, because we knew we we're going to make mistakes along the way. It's four weeks. We don't really have time to really do a do over. Like what we build has to go live at the end of the day. Um, and we went with that. Um, and what we didn't know at the time is that it also added something very important. And that's what I now call shit hits the fan protection. Um, because as we approached 
the end of the end of our uh, uh, implementation time, um, this happened. Um, Colin, as he was supposed to, tweeted about uh, just do it and started the campaign. Unfortunately, the campaign was started a little early, um, so we we weren't quite ready at that point yet. We had a few things to do. I'm still left. However, I got a phone call and we said, "Can you launch now?" Um, we, we need to launch very, very quickly because this tweet wasn't supposed to go out. And we said, sure, let's go. And that is because the Jamstack allowed us to go fast. Like if we had to set up a Kubernetes production instance with Redis and all other sort of databases at that point, after not having slept for a few days, I don't think this would have gone well. Instead, we were just able to add a new account or a new project to Firebase, uh, add a credit card and just be done with it and just launch. And we were pretty confident that this was gonna work. We made it through that. Um, the numbers were, were great. Um, we had, uh, on average, more than 200,000 visits per day. We had a total of 190,000 submissions, which is great. And we got the first meaningful paint of, of 1.5 seconds, which is which is wonderful from a, from a speed perspective. Um, so all of this was great. Um, and we had fun. Like, we didn't need to launch on Nike.com's homepage because that was a a step too far, so the numbers were a little lower than we than we feared, um, and everything worked well because there was no impact to the core infrastructure either. Right, Nike's core infrastructure was was very much like it was before. Um, we didn't hurt them. Um, it was all on us, and everything scaled well. No hiccups or anything like that. Um, so I would say that was a good launch because we didn't do everything right, um, and I love to use this uh, this tweet. Um, and this time I censored who sent it because I don't want to do any name calling besides Gatsby um, who called us out on it. Um, but there's always something that we can do better. Um, at this time we didn't use Gatsby image. So we were like, what is Gatsby image? Because we hadn't used it before. Um, so thank you for calling us on our uh, on our mistakes. It's always good to, to see that candor out in the wild. Um, right, that, not always is criticism this constructive. So this was great. Um, I'd also like to point out that maybe we have, would have had a Gatsby image if you had enough time to launch all of this, but um, I'm going to leave this out. Um, so the project launched, right? Pencils down, done. Let's go home. Um, that's it. Not quite. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the mistakes that we made. Um, small mistakes were made, obviously, right? Um, and we did a retrospective and we're like, okay, we could have done this better. We had, we had a laundry list of backlog items that we should have done better for next time. However, um, what we realized over the next couple of weeks after the launch was that Nike struggled actually editing and adding content, right? Um, they asked us to tell stories without the rigor that they see on Nike.com and have a CMS that supports that and, and have fun with it and be able to tell these stories fast enough. So we thought, yeah, we're gonna deliver you something with the core flexibility of Squarespace so you can put everything together, but it's headless. So it's all very, uh, it's very dogmatic about the separation of content and, and presentation. And this CMS was very dogmatic around this, um, but that doesn't work all that well. If your client is not confident enough to manage content and to add content, um, you didn't do your job right. And that was a big, big point of uh, failure for us that the client wasn't actually able to uh, build content or create content as fast as they wanted and play with the content and play with the stories as much as they wanted. Um, but we built at, at the time we built what was recommended to us. This is how you build um, uh, long form content and article form content and so forth. And, and it was best practice. But best practice didn't really translate all that well into uh, how humans think. And with that, we ask ourselves, well, what is the purpose of a CMS? Um, and the developers among us would say, well, the, the purpose of a CMS is actually to provide a content database for developers. And I challenge you on that. Um, if you have to leave in the next two minutes or so, please take one thing away. And that is, we do not believe that a CMS is a content database for developers. We think a CMS should actually primarily be a great authoring experience for authors. And that is a very important difference that um, we had to end up realizing. Um, and that was a very tough lesson for us to learn. 
uh, a client, a potential client recently put it as such. She she said, hey, I, and she is on the same CMS. Um, she is like, I, you know what? I just don't want to call a developer every time I want to make a fucking content change. And that's a verbatim quote. I, I try not to swear on these, but that was a verbatim quote. Um, but it was very crass. And we chuckled and we know the, we know the feeling, right? Um, but that was it. Uh, in our industry, we hand projects off and uh, we never see them again and, and they go away. And sometimes we're embedded for a long time, but um, we were lucky this time. Um, we got to meet twice. Um, three months later, we got a call that went something like this. Hey, let's do another one of these Just Do It sites because they like them, right? They, they saw a lot of traffic, they saw a lot of uh, um, uh, conversion and, and all of that. So, but, but this time they wanted adding content just a little bit less of a pain in the ass and maybe also not bother us all the time um, to help them and it's very unusual to get the second try in our industry i can i can tell you that um so this was a welcome surprise um but we also wanted to make sure that hey being good stewards of of money even if it's a big client like nike we always want to make sure that whatever we do saves people money and actually is cost effective right because these things matter. These are not just for us. These are not cost centers. These are actually profit centers and these experiences. Um, and we want to make sure that we do the right thing with the money. Um, so we said, yes, please, right? Uh, we, we want to do this. And uh, we did this by reusing a lot of components um, that we had in the first experience and reused about 90% of the components in the new experience to really, really save time and money. And emotion uh, being the amazing tool that it is also allowed us to save like a lot of the theme that we had already created. So we were able to reuse pretty much the entire theme that we had created the previous time, like let alone a few uh, type changes and type hierarchy changes, but um, we were able to reuse pretty much everything. Um, we also decided to shift hosting providers because we, our idea was just to get below one second on the first meaningful thing. And we have good experiences with uh, in the meantime with with a new cdn and that was netlify um so we decided hey let's switch from uh from firebase to netlify um and that is a breeze so that's one part of switching a backend is, is switching hosting and cdn providers right and that was a breeze that if you ever switch cdns um it's as easy as switching a a, a git repository um in fact impossible foods runs on both right now it runs on firebase and on netlify at the same time because it's so easy to run them in parallel um, however, there's another step. We used a lot of cloud functions in the first experience and those needed to be moved over. That took a little bit longer, um, but we also decided to redo uh, most of them because the first ones were written in, in plain JavaScript. We actually wanted to move them into TypeScript. Um, we reused the share uh, a cloud function um, that we actually created to create these custom assets because Facebook will ping our site for the OG uh, image and we used actually a cloud function to generate that image. Um, so we moved that one over, but um, that was a relatively painful, uh, painless process um, overall. That was really a no-brainer, uh, maybe uh, maybe a day or a couple of days. Not the big elephant in the room, um, the CMS. Um, the, the point was when we explained to them like what the CMS does is they, they came to us and were like, we don't need a content infrastructure. We just need a tool to build an engaging website. We already have a content infrastructure. Um, well, we just need a fun CMS that we can tell these stories better. And um, that was a that was a hard a hard uh, response to hear um, because obviously we had messed up. And uh, what we wanted to provide was a was a fun, engaging tool like like Squarespace, but headless. Right? Like, how can we create a tool for them that allows them to experiment and have fun with their stories and move things around and have these highly bespoke experiences? but still provide a great architecture that works well. Um, well, we settled on something that's a little bit closer to a web CMS and that ended up being Dotto CMS, um, much smaller than what we had before. And uh, we evaluated a few contenders and even worked with our clients on, on what feels best for them. And yeah, we settled on Dotto CMS, uh, much more geared towards um, pages and, and kind of that idea of, of making a website instead of having a content infrastructure. 
So that was great. We, we understood what tool we needed to move forward. But what we also needed to do was retool our architecture because everything was tightly coupled between the components that we had in our, in our experience and the CMS structure. Right. That that's why this became a mess in the first place because we mimicked types in the CMS and the front end. Um, so we ended up to having to decouple what we have in our CMS from our components. And instead of redoing everything in the front end, we just decided to leave the components alone, but instead insert a middle layer that actually maps um, CMS types to our components uh, in a more sane way. Because we we realized by decoupling this, we actually allow ourselves to not have the same types in the CMS as we have in our components. And what I mean by that is that many CMS types can actually map to the same component. Um, so you can say, hey, you have a you have a button here uh, that's an inline button in a paragraph. You can say you have a button here that's on a hero component and so forth. Um, they can actually all map to the same button component, but they don't have to be one type in the CMS. They can be 10 different types in the CMS. And it makes it much easier for a human to think about these things when they don't have to click different like little fields to configure everything and whatnot. But also on the other side, a CNS type that can actually be split into multiple components. So we can take a few attributes of the CMS type and, and actually map them to multiple components or to one component. For example, a hero can have two attributes um, and we'll see this in a second, um, how we can actually map these little attributes into a button. Um, so for example here, this is how we see most CMS systems. You have a button type in your CMS and it turns into a button component in your, in your front end. As a label, has an action and has accessibility labels and accessibility types, right? And this maps directly to properties. And then you have a paragraph uh, that has a bunch of buttons in it and that links and nests and gets incredibly difficult to use um, because it nests and links and all of that. How about we actually create types that are local to the paragraph only, because we can do this. Um, we don't have to make this a link to a button because at the end of the day, we can just map this to a button component. We don't want to duplicate the button component, but duplicating types in a CMS and copy them is actually extremely simple. It's extremely cheap and extremely safe um, in terms of like getting, getting lost in the weeds because we can always track what types actually map to what component. But also the other side, right, is we can create a hero component in our CMS or a hero type in our CMS that just has two attributes called the CTA label and the CTA link. Those two attributes can then also actually map to a button component. And we do this, if you're a developer, you, you, you will see where I'm going with this. These are all factories that we built internally inside of our mapping code. We take a GraphQL, run it through a factory, and then actually create the component that we want out of this. And that worked extremely well. And uh, in, the, in the computer science realm, we have a, a name for this, and that is called denormalization. And I, uh, I would ask you, for the sake of your users, to denormalize your CMS. Um, because it, what saves database uh, compute cycles also saves a, a human headaches. So um, this has helped us immensely to actually create better authoring experiences. Because we want to make your CMS enjoyable, uh, a CMS enjoyable for humans. Um, because Gatsby doesn't need your help. Gatsby is great at, at, at using denormalized data and mapping it to something else, right? Gatsby is perfectly content doing this during build time. We don't need to optimize for that during, a, during our design phase for the CMS. Um, and this transition took us about a week. Um, give or take a few days, um, which is to say, if you look at, and I've been part of these uh, transition projects a few times where a client approaches with, can we go from site core to AEM? And those projects usually end up being nine months and they cost a few million dollars, um, which is an entirely different ball game than, oh, we need a different CMS for a big experience, but um, it only takes a week to go from one to the other. And that is a huge, difference because I dare you do this quicker than with this technology. Um, I don't think you'll find a quicker way. I haven't found a quicker way than, uh, than doing this within a week um, and making it so easy and safe and, and just launch again. Well, what we also did this time around is we actually allowed Nike to uh, observe us build the CMS. So they used it as we built the CMS out 
and really make the CMS build part of the handoff um, at every milestone. Um, we work in variable sprint lengths and every, uh, every sprint has a milestone and we actually um, work with Nike every, after every sprint to, to under, make them understand how they can use the CMS. All right, we're finally done. All right, this is it. Like you don't usually get a third try. Well, um, I gotta say, Dotto CMS performed really well. Um, we were happy because Dotto CMS has a fun feature that's called uh, time deploy. So these content launches are always at six in the morning or five in the morning. And finally, we didn't have to get, or I didn't have to get up at six in the morning. Uh, and I am not a morning person by any by any stretch of the imagination. So this is great. Um, and everything was great. But after a week of having this live, um, somebody at Netlify decided to tweet out that just do it.nike.com was on Netlify. And in our industry, that's a big no-no because you can't just claim something from a big brand like this without former approval. Um, so they had to blame this on someone um, who did this because Nike was well aware um, that they didn't do this. Uh, they had tried um, they would have liked to because there's a lot of smart people over in that team and uh, they just didn't get around to it yet. So they they looked around and asked around who built this experience and uh, we were to blame, right? Um, in hindsight, all good things. Um, so they reached out to us. They're like, hey, we've been trying to figure out how to integrate Jamstack into our environment. Would you be willing to work with us on this? And they're like, uh, sure, why not, right? Like this sounds like a fun challenge. And uh, Nike has proprietary CMS and it's a wonderful CMS, but it's not driven, um, it's not made for uh, for the Jamstack. So we had to understand how can we make this thing actually uh, speak GraphQL. And funny enough, this was the only hurdle that we had. Um, because we decoupled the entire front end already, we just had to make this CMS speak GraphQL. So we were able to leverage the entire Gatsby site that we already had and just figure out this little tiny connector between a proprietary CMS that had not even seen the light of day from anyone else and moved into a Gatsby or a Jamstack experience. That was all that was required. Um, now we we created an internal product on our side. This is we have a proprietary product now where we do this more often uh, for EM and Sitecore. Um, uh, you probably hear more about this later this year, but um, for now, yeah, this was this is a fun experience. It took us about two weeks to create the GraphQL layer between their CMS and uh, and and the front end, but the front end stayed pretty much the same. And we had time to spare to actually take Nike's internal React components and make them into Gatsby capable um, static site compiled uh, components. So we took their component library and made uh, some Gatsby components out of it, which is fun. Um, and now we can actually leverage their component library in our front end experiences. Um, so I double dare you to switch CMS systems twice in that amount of time um, and not have anything break and reuse most of what you do. I don't think you're gonna find this anywhere. Um, because for us in the end, uh, the authoring experience actually has become a, a cornerstone of, of what we do. Um, so we wanna make sure that we get this right. And for us, it's important that we actually do decouple these things. Um, and what also happened is that these robust and thoughtful tools actually really created the room for us to create. And by that, I mean Gatsby and Netlify and Firebase and all of those tools that are built extremely in an extremely thoughtful way allow us to breathe a little bit and to focus on other things and create value for our clients that wasn't there before. Um, and if you work, if you're a small agency of eight people and you get to work with Nike, you need that room to explore, but also to make mistakes. Um, what we want to make sure is that we can take risks because that's how we are successful. But for us, taking risks means we don't want to hurt our clients, right? And tools that are robust like this that don't break just because something small doesn't work out and, and all of that really helps us to take that risk, to go a step further, to push a little bit further, but not hurt our clients in the process um, because they trust us sometimes with their livelihood, sometimes with their big dreams. Um, and that is very, very important to us. And for us, being able to select tools that, that help us do that is, is very important. But also the reason I'm talking about this um, and, and I'm closing with this is um, for us taking risks in our organization should actually be accessible to everyone. Um, 
having tools like this in place where everybody in our organization can actually take a risk and go out there and lead and say like, I'm gonna do this. Um, it's not gonna impact everything, but I'm gonna learn something from it is very important because for us, this creates actually a, a culture where leadership comes from bottom up because people are empowered to, to take these risks and, and they are a little bit more and learn something. And what I wanna close with is the wrong CMS. You didn't hear me talk about the wrong CMS or you, you heard me quote it. Um, and I wanna say that the first CMS wasn't wrong. Um, we use it all the time and I deliberately didn't mention it by name um, because it's a great tool. Um, it's very well built. The support is great from the team um, and they care a lot. Um, it was the wrong tool for the job and we probably didn't hold it right which is which is a problem and i think many other people don't hold it right either um, which is another problem so we got to figure this out um, but the tool itself was great if you need a content infrastructure like if you compare it to uh, other big players um, in the market uh, this cms is still like top notch and we still use it to this day so it wasn't wrong or i would say it's a bad cms or anything like that it was just the wrong tool for the job and for the scale that we need and uh with that i'm about to hand off back to gatsby i want to say thank you um don't be a stranger um and please do swing by our offices in medellin or portland um the space in medellin is gorgeous um all doors always open our uh, office here in portland is also always open so swing by have a coffee um, we have tons of good coffee shops uh, nearby and um, uh, a little little thing on the side we're hiring uh, we're hiring developers and product owners uh, at this point and uh, starting in april we're also going to be accepting new clients again which is which is exciting for us um, to uh, get another uh, to to expand that a little bit and uh, you can always reach us at supply.co and uh, you can always put something on my calendar I'm going to calendly.com slash Mark Amon. And uh, yeah, hope to talk to you all soon. And again, thank you for uh, for having me. Uh, back to you, Kate. Right. Thank you so much, Mark. Let me just take control. So we're gonna take a few minutes for questions. If anybody had um, anything that they wanted to ask right now, um, let me see, are we showing my screen? Yes, we can see, all right. Um, so the first question we have is, how did you handle user submissions and serverless functions? That was um, that was with serverless functions, yeah. Um, so we basically said uh, it was on Google Cloud functions with Firebase functions um, that would eventually turn these uh, dreams into Firebase entries. Um, which then real time streamed out because Firebase has this real time functionality, so we um, sent it back out. Um, but we the intake was through a cloud functions, but then we subscribed to a, a Firebase real time update on the front end. Great. All right. So I will mark this. Oh, what was the third CMS that you had mentioned? Um, it's. Uh, <laughs> it's a tool called Iris. Um, it's an internal proprietary CMS at Nike, um, and it's great because um, it's a headless CMS that has preview functionality. I can't tell you too much about it because it's proprietary, <laughs> but it's a wonderful CMS. And um, and the other one you mentioned was Dato, correct? Yep. That, that was D-A-T-O. Like, D-A-T-O. Yeah, great. All right. Uh, our next question is... Um, Okay, I think we just answered that. So Dato was the one that you used um, to create a better authoring experience for the content creators, but then ultimately you ended up on the proprietary Nike one. So we will call that one yep. checked. Um, did you evaluate any other headless CMSs? Oh yeah, um, uh, that was a few long days. Um, <laughs> We ended up uh, evaluating, Prismic was uh, was the other contender um, that we really looked at. Um, we evaluated about five or six. Um, currently, most of our stack actually runs on Prismic. Um, Dato for smaller experiences, but Prismic really powers the, the bigger experiences that we do now. Um, so Prismic was a big contender, but um, we ended up going with Dato at, at that point. 
And um, and we got a question in GoToWebinar about um, what was the name of the initial CMS that you had set up in the first launch of the site? <laughs> um, uh, they talk about them. So I don't want to like really. Talk <laughs> you don't want to call anybody out. Great, no, but, that's fair. No, I don't want to call anybody out. Um, okay. It, I mean, if you if you think about somebody who calls himself a content infrastructure, you know who I'm talking about. Okay. All right. So we looked at this. Uh, what would be the killer feature for your dream CMS? <laughs> um, I think I think Gatsby has just built this uh, with uh, with the preview functionality. And by the way, if you haven't checked this out, this is this is amazing. Pre Gatsby preview and Gatsby build together are some fucking dream functionalities right there. Um, I'd love for that to be embedded deeper into CMS systems to actually have better preview in a CMS and and allow people to go back to uh, the WordPress functionality a little bit because uh, we have a lot of clients right now that come to us from a headless CMS that are like, can we do WordPress? And we're like, I don't think you want that. We don't want it um, for sure, but that's something that happens right now. Great. Cool, and I see Dustin has joined as well. And Dustin, if you have any questions that you wanna answer, feel free to jump in. Um, we'll just take a couple more questions right now and then we'll hand things over to Bob to do his presentation. Um, so the next question is, I'm always stumbling with preview functionality with CMSs and Jamstack. Can you comment on your experiences with content previews in the Jamstack? Yeah, it's very tough. Um... Uh, before Gatsby Preview, this was one of our biggest gripes, and we had an EC2 instance that would basically do the Gatsby develop part on an EC2 um, to update content as it loads in, but it broke all the time because sometimes you need to refresh the entire build. Um, that is very hard, and that is something that I think we missed when we as a, as a group, uh, as an entire group of technologists, moved into the Jamstack realm and said everything needs to be headless. We, we forgot that people really need the preview functionality because people build experiences. So that is a uh, um, Gatsby preview. I, I tell you, it works well um, and it does its job really well. And even with Gatsby build, you build something in 30 seconds if you need to. Great. All right. So Bob, I'm going to hand things over to you now. And once again, we'll take more questions once Bob has wrapped up. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Kaylin. I appreciate it. Uh, let me switch over to my screen all right uh, so i think we're ready to go uh thanks everybody uh for joining today's webinar uh, kind of like what mark said uh, builds and preview are uh, two of the really big huge uh, awesome product launches that i'm super excited to uh, actually show uh today for you um like caitlin mentioned my name is bob orchard i'm the senior product manager here with gatsby um, I've actually been doing some work on my personal website, so I'll demo that as part of this. Um, a couple of fun facts about me. Uh, I'm an Eagle Scout uh, with Boy Scouts. Uh, I spent two and a half years traveling around the U.S. in a RV while working remotely for another software company. Uh, and when I'm not working on software products, I uh, do a little bit of woodworking and uh, leather working. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is switch over. Um, I've got my personal website running locally on my computer. On the right-hand side is my code editor IDE of choice, which is VS Code. Um, what I'm going to do here real quick, I'm going to show you uh, Gatsby updating uh, in real time locally, uh, what that looks like when we publish a code-related change. Uh, and then I'll show you what it looks like uh, when you're using a third-party CMS uh, like Contentful, for instance. Um, so I've done a little bit of writing uh, with my own personal website here, uh, but on this post here, uh, one thing that uh, I noticed, I made a mistake on it. Uh, I actually have a, a tag for travel uh, that I'm going to update to conferences. And uh, as soon as I make that change, you can see Gatsby updating that preview uh, in real time for me uh, directly uh, uh, running locally on my uh, personal computer here. So I'm going to grab that change real quick. on tag and I'm going to push that change up uh, so once I've uh, pushed that change up you'll see that uh, let's see here cool um, you'll see that uh, Gatsby uh, cloud is watching for any of those changes uh, with the code on the website itself and so um, 
because we keep all of the cash uh, around from the last build, um, we actually build uh, the sites much faster than almost anybody else out there. Uh, and so we're gonna give this a little bit of time to run here. Uh, and what we'll see from the logs here, I'm actually deploying my site out to uh, Netlify CDN. And it doesn't take too long to go ahead and run. And like I said, that's because we keep the house around, we keep everything around, uh, make only the changes necessary and deploy out to uh, your CDN or your host of choice. Uh, so we're gonna give that just a couple seconds here. And then most of my builds uh, for my site take about a minute or so. Uh, once I've uh, implemented Contentful and uh, I've got changes that happen locally, uh, things run about the minute to, to minute and 10 second range. Uh, and what you'll see from the build here is we also run a series of Lighthouse reports. Uh, so this will give you a lot of great information uh, on each individual build uh, about accessibility and performance uh, reporting directly from Lighthouse. Uh, so we're going to check that out real quick before we jump over and look at my own personal site. All right, it looks like the report came in. Uh, most of it's looking pretty good. Uh, we show the uh, results of the Lighthouse reports on each of the build steps or builds here. Uh, when I look at uh, an individual build, uh, I can actually dig into the full report here. Uh, it looks like everything's going good. Uh, I need to do a little bit more work on my SEO, uh, but I'll definitely get back to that uh, uh, later here. Uh, but most importantly, let's take a look at my uh, site here. And we'll double check to make sure that that uh, tag was updated. And so we can see here, uh, tags been updated to conferences. Uh, Gatsby's gone through and built um, out the uh, tags for me uh, and linked the post and everything's good to go just with a small change. Uh, but one of the really cool things that I'm super excited about uh, is the preview for Gatsby Cloud. Uh, so if I look over here on the preview tab, uh, you can see that I've got all of my changes running in real time here. Um, if I bump over to Contentful, I'm going to create a, a new post here. Contest. Post. And then on the right hand side, it's a little bit what Mark was talking about earlier. Uh, we have Gatsby preview running directly within Contentful CMS. And so as I'm making changes here, um, you'll see that uh, those data updates are coming in from Contentful. And as soon as I'm ready to preview, uh, I can clip, open up that post uh, directly on, oh, we finished filling this out. more information here and let's grab a tag all right so you can see preview update less than five seconds ago uh, we'll go back to take a look at it you can see that uh, everything's been updated if I wanted to go ahead and make a change uh, preview updates really really fast uh, and this is what Mark was alluding to like we're trying to bring that publishing experience uh, and the preview closer to all of the headless CMSs. Uh, so this is a change. And you can see in just less than a couple of seconds, um, preview's been updated. You can see those changes in real time. But once I've got all of my changes and all of my content done, um, what really matters is actually publishing and making that change live. Uh, and these all exist within the preview environment within Gatsby Cloud. Um, but as you can see from my own website, uh, we don't have that post available or live. And so I'm going to go ahead and publish that directly from Contentful and bump over to our production tab here. Uh, you'll see that we've watched for a webhook from Contentful. Uh, we know that you've published uh, some content. We automatically trigger a rebuild of the site. Uh, looks like I bumped the wrong button here. Um, actually, it looks like uh, it's going to rebuild manually. Um, I'm going to give that a little bit of time to complete. So we'll give that a, a few minutes, a few seconds here.
So you can see it's queued the next uh, update, uh, but we're still processing the data update from Contentful. Let's go ahead and see where that is at. All right, it's uploading and deploying. And then we give you a uh, link for each of these deploys. Uh, we can click on and see that change. All right, I'm gonna wait for that other deploy here to finish. And uh, you saw just in real time here, the uh, Lighthouse reports come back in from the data update from Contentful. Uh, and that happens in real time uh, directly within the dashboard within Gatsby Cloud. Take a look and see where we're at here. Uh, rebuilding a couple of images. Uh, one of the great things I love about Gatsby Cloud is we actually offload uh, through the build set, we offload all the image processing. Uh, so that helps dramatically speed up your builds as well. So this build uh, that's running right now um, is actually a full rebuild um, where the cache and everything's been dumped. Uh, so this is much like uh, when you first publish to Gatsby, it takes a little bit longer because it starts from a cold start, um, but any subsequent rebuilds uh, are actually quite a bit faster. So it's running the Lighthouse reports, that changes live. And so if I jump over to my personal site and refresh, you can see our test webinar post uh, available right now. Uh, and that uh, in total uh, is a lot of the great features that I love about Gatsby Cloud, builds and preview. Um, I've shown a little bit of what it looks like when you're previewing content from a headless CMS, uh, when you're deploying file changes out through uh, Gatsby Cloud, uh, as well as what happens when you publish content directly from a, uh, a headless CMS such as Contentful. Uh, and so with that, um, Caitlin, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, looks like uh, we're probably ready for some questions here. And uh, I've got Dustin, uh, one of our other product managers, uh, actually I had a product at Gatsby uh, that's on the call with us as well. And uh, he'll be helping answer some of the questions uh, that everybody's asked. Great, thank you so much, Bob. And um, for everyone's reference, we will be sharing the recording of this webinar with everyone, um, you know, sometime within the next 24 hours, um, if not today. So our next question is, how did you manage scope creep and handling client expectations? So it sounds like that's probably a question for Mark. Yeah, I think Mark. that was one that tagged around. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it has to be a scope creep, uh, scope creep too. <laughs> um, uh, I think client expectations are managed through uh, uh, history for one um, we knew the client before and they trusted us to do the right thing um, but also understanding that we don't necessarily work in in a sprint agile way of like two weeks or one week sprints we work very variable in the sprint length and really talking to the client and saying like hey look i, I think we're gonna get this far um but we still keep the objective in mind like whatever we do the objective is very important to us and it's not that we need to adhere 100 percent to the design but the objective is very important and uh, having a client understand that is extremely valuable and and i know we don't have every client that completely is is in line with that they sometimes do require and everything is pixel perfect and that is hard um that is a long process um to move them away from that and show them that you're doing the right thing for the right reason um, and and what is the right thing to actually launch um i don't have a silver bullet unfortunately um for you here all right. And yeah, these are probably going to kind of switch between um, questions for Mark and questions for Bob and Dustin. So our next question is, when is GatsbyJS.com going to support other Git sites such as GitLab and Bitbucket? I can answer that. So also, um, great question. So um, we don't have the, the firm uh, date commitments on that yet, but it is on our roadmap and we um, in the same way that you know Gatsby can source inputs from anywhere, we want to be able to um, you know source your site from anywhere. So right now we just support GitHub with Gatsby Cloud, 
Um, but in the future, we definitely want to support GitLab and Bitbucket. Um, so we've definitely heard that request a couple of times. So thanks for providing another data point for us to um, help prioritize that. What CMSs currently support Gatsby Preview from within the CMS? Uh, another great question. So if you go to, to gatsbyjs.com and forward slash cloud, you can see what we call first class integrations. And so those are the integrations that um, integrate with Gatsby Cloud, like out of the box. And so that includes things like for several of them, we can automatically provision. So we can sync up with your instance or even create a new instance in your CMS. And then of course, the expectation that experience that um, you know, you change content and you have like a live preview, you trigger a build and you have a build created. And so uh, notably it's Sanity, Data CMS, Cosmic, um, and then several other CMSs are supported um, out of the box right now. And we'll keep working on getting more and more CMSs integrated into our Gatsby Cloud platform. Great. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions that came in go to webinar. The first is, is there an open source CMS you'd recommend for this type of project, like the Nike project? Um, so I'm curious what, what Mark thinks on that. Um, I don't know of a ton of open source CMSs. So uh, I know there are shades of Drupal being open source. Drupal works quite well, works with Caspi Preview. Um, I've quite liked like Netlify CMS, if you can, um, go the whole flat file approach, meaning like um, just create markdown files. Um, so those are the two that I've seen that are you know, open source or kind of like um, mostly open source. Uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm curious if Mark has others that he would recommend. I think I wish I did, um, <laughs> but no, I do not. Like a, a open source CMS, we've, we've used WordPress as a data source before, which works reasonably well, thanks to Gatsby integration. Um, not ideal, but I mean, it's open source and it's free and, and, and it's come a long way. Yeah. Also, just a note on that, we're actually actively working on getting WordPress integrated first class in Gatsby Cloud. So um, for those in the audience who are using WordPress, which I'd imagine is a fair amount of you, um, expect some more updates on that soon. Great. All right, our next question is, do you find clients are afraid to move to the Jamstack, serverless, headless CMS, et cetera? So I can answer that, and then I would really love to hear what Mark thinks too. So what, what we're doing with Gatsby Cloud is we're making that pitch for the user of Gatsby, oftentimes a developer, as easy as possible. So kind of where Gatsby Cloud is right now is we want to make the developer's pitch as easy as possible. So you know the content editor, the marketing team, um, you know kind of the key stakeholders who you're kind of replacing their tooling and giving them a better website as a result. Uh, Gatsby Cloud is intended to make that sales pitch as easy as possible. So Mark was saying like preview has really been like a game changer for them. That's the same, that's like the success story that we want everyone to be able to experience because we think this is the way you should build for the web, you know, Jamstack, serverless, Gatsby, et cetera. But I'm curious what Mark thinks. Yeah, I think for, I mean, as you said, right, um, I think preview has been a big, big item for that. It was certainly harder in the past to make people switch completely to the Jamstack, but we've also mostly abandoned that approach where we say we, well, why don't you move incrementally to a Jamstack? We have clients who are on Shopify where we take a small subset of what they have and optimize it on the Jamstack. So we optimize the homepage, we optimize the collections page, leave the rest on Shopify. Um, we have people, uh, clients who are on WordPress who we we just um, create parts of it on, on, uh, on the Jamstack, right? So when people start to see how flexible it is and easy to integrate, they actually get the appetite to do it more and more. And even with Nike, right? They have a, a giant content infrastructure that is really, really well built. Like nowhere, I would never like recommend that they move to the Jamstack because it's all really well built. But for some offshoot experiences that they need, the Jamstack performed really well. And I think that's how we take the fear away of like, we don't want you to switch over. This is not a wholesale approach. We, we slowly take you to create a, a great experience. Great. Our next question is, in terms of UX, what headless CMS is most friendly for marketing teams who don't care what headless means and who will never say the word Jamstack? And actually, I might jump in on that a little and then Mark and Dustin, if you have thoughts as well. But I mean, I would say it really, the CMS um, usability depends a lot on how you or you know your dev team or whoever sets it up, how well they set it up, how, you know, how much time they spend thinking about what the marketing team needs in terms of layout building. Um, so it's, 
you know, a, a lot of them are very powerful. It's really just a question of the work you put into um, building your particular setup of the CMS. So yeah, Mark and Dustin, I don't know if you want to jump in on that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the answer is it depends. Um, there's something like usability, uh, Contentful uh, often pairs quite nicely with Gatsby Cloud, but um, very much uh, one of the key value statements of Gatsby is that we want you to be able to use the tools that you're using to be effective. So I wouldn't say there's like a most friendly. I think that's kind of like work with the marketing team, kind of reach out to them to, to see like what they like. And then more often times, more times, more often than not, um, Gatsby will support that headless CMS. And so uh, I think it's a great question though, because, um, you know, the marketing team really doesn't care about the term Jamstack. What they care about is that they can have a great workflow, uh, which I think Gatsby Cloud supports. And then also what they care about or should care about is the performance, uh, you know, the, the end user experience of the site that you're generating with Gatsby and Gatsby Cloud. All right, um, and we are at time um, and you know, I wanna be respectful. So I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, we'll try to follow up um, afterwards where we can. And you can of course bring your question to our Twitter account or the Ask Gatsby JS Twitter account and we'll try to get to you. Um, thank you all so much for joining us and thank you Mark for presenting, it was great. And thank you Bob as well. And thanks Dustin for helping out with the questions. All right, we'll be sending out the recording hopefully in a few hours. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.